Well, good morning, church, and welcome to Wall Missoula Church Online. My name is Brad. I'm happy to be here with you today, and I got a secret to tell you. And my secret is this: I want to be the person that God wants to give to the world, right? I want to be a gift to this world. I want to be the husband that God wants to give to my wife, and I want to be the father that God wants to give to my kids, and the son that God wants to give to my parents, the brother that God wants to give to my siblings. I want to be the friend that God wants to give to my friends and the citizen that God wants to give to my to my city and my state and my country. I just want to be the person that God wants to give to this world. But I don't know about you. Uh, actually, I probably do know about you just because it's a common thing that happens with humans. When we try to be these things and bring the greatest version of ourselves to bear, take away the bad, put in the good, we usually suffer a lot of failure in that area. So we started a new series a few weeks ago. We're in week five right now called Changed by God. And the idea is this, the greatest version of ourselves is the godliest version of ourselves and only God can make us godly. But that doesn't mean we just sit on the sidelines and do exactly nothing. The Bible teaches that there's some things that we can put into place and practices that we can do on our end that open the door for God to change us at the heart level. That's the whole idea behind this series. So we've talked through things like like reading the Bible and, and intaking God's word and praying and, and conversing with God, being on mission with him and meditating on the Bible so that we know what to pray. And this week, we're going to talk about worshiping and worshiping from meditating on what God says in his word and what he's done in our lives. And so that's where we're going. And when you talk about worship, man, it's funky because as a pastor, I'm always trying to convince people like, hey, you need to hear what God has for you. Hey, you need to experience uh, godly biblical community, you need to see what this thing's about because it's not what is said in university classrooms. It's not what's said on TV. It's not what's uh, said in, in best-selling books. Those, those are all just caricatures and misrepresentations. You got to come see this thing for yourself. And so people will come and they'll check it out and, and they hit this wall where it's like, man, the singing thing is weird, right? Because it's, they understand teaching and like, we're going to read the Bible and kind of talk about how that matters in life. Like that, that, those dots connect well. But when it's like, hey, why are we in a room singing? It gets a little confusing. I'll tell people like, hey, we're just a church that, that, that sings. There's a reason we do that. And I want to talk about that. And people are always like, man, I'm just, I'm not into singing. I'm just not into singing. And I go Yoda on them. I'm like, you will be, right? And so it's, it's that, man. We sing. Why? Because we are born worshipers. Everybody worships something. Everybody praises something. I'll give you an example. If you have a favorite sports team, uh, you go to a big game, whatever, and a big play is made, you'll throw your arms up. Whoa! did you see that play? And then you'll go talk about it at work or with your friends and your neighbors the next day, right? You'll sit and just say, did you see that catch? Did you see that hit? Uh, we praise uh, sales teams. We will sit and say, man, my sales team is just killing it right now. We always be closing. And so we're just doing that. We praise food, right? Hands down, best steak in the valley. We'll praise weird things sometimes, like strange, awkward things like, man, I, I got to be honest. These are just the most supportive underwear I've ever had, you know? And so it's just, that's, that's weird. Let's just move on. We'll conversely also look at things and say, well, that's not worth your praise. That's actually bad. And so we'll say that food was terrible. That movie was awful. Did you see what she was wearing on that show last night? You know why we do that? Because as people made in the image of God, we are always scanning for something worthy. We are always scanning and ascribing value and worth to things. In fact, that's where the word worship comes from. It's an old Saxon word that was worth-ship, and it means to ascribe worth. And so when you worship God, what you're doing is you're saying to God, here's who you are, and you are worthy. One of the clearest examples of this in the Bible, one of the most straightforward ones, is in the book of Revelation. And the book of Revelation was written by one of Jesus' 12 disciples. It was John. And John is given a vision by God of heaven and what uh, worship looks like in heaven at his present at the time. And so look at the picture that he gives in Revelation 5, verses 11 through 13. He says, Then I looked and I heard around the throne. This is the throne of Jesus. Jesus came to earth. He stepped out of eternity. He came to earth. Uh, put on humanity, added humanity to his divinity, lived a perfect life. He died on the cross to make payment for sins. Death couldn't keep him down. He rose again on the third day. And because of the perfect life and sacrifice that he was, because he overcame the grave, he ascended into heaven and he's seated at the right hand of God and all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to him. So boom, so throne room, that's where we are here. 
I looked and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders and the voice of many angels numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands. This is a whole lot of creatures, right? A whole lot of people saying in verse 12 with a loud voice, ready? Worthy. Worthy. They're ascribing worth. Worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. Worthy. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And this is a beautiful, pure picture of ascribing worth and worship, right? A beautiful picture of, of worship. Now, here's what's funky. I told you that we're all programmed to worship. We all just naturally do it. We're always ascribing worth. Now, listen, I'm going to do something where I'm going to replace the lamb who was slain with your favorite politician. Why don't we just start there? And you tell me if you think this sounds off. In fact, I'm betting you're going to go, that sounds heretical. So let's do this. Worthy is your favorite politician from your favorite political party, whoever you think is going to save the world to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. That doesn't quite fit, does it? Right? How about your favorite celebrity? Man, worthy is your favorite celebrity to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. No? How about an inanimate object that people give themselves to and put their trust and their faith in? Worthy is money to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. Worthy is your favorite hobby to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. Worthy is sex to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. Worthy are drugs. You, you get the idea, right? Sounds heretical. You know what? It is. It actually is. And none of us would ever say that. Like, we would never explicitly sit down and do that, but we do it all the time in practice. We do it all the time in the world. Here's the one that actually is most common, right? Here's the one that's most common. Worthy am I. Worthy am I to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. You know, we spend a whole lot of time, when you look at the rebellion in Genesis chapter 3, the tempter comes to God's first people and he says, hey, you can be like God. You can set the rules. You can answer to yourself. You can receive all praise and glory. It can all be about you and your name and your renown and your greatness. And you can receive all the applause and affirmation. And they fell for that. You will be like God, knowing good and evil. And they fell for that temptation. And all of us have been doing it ever since then. And so one of the challenges that you get with worship is asking the question, well, what's in it for me? When we're talking about being changed by God, what do I get from that? Well, here's the primary thing. Worship's primary benefit to me is that worship's not primarily about me, right? It breaks that thing. Worship is not primarily about me. It's about God. It's about who he is. And Now, look, listen, it has downstream benefits, okay? Like worshiping God, praising God actually has downstream benefits. Just like if you were ever dating and you were dating someone that you were just, just just madly in love with and someone comes and they ask you like, hey, how's the relationship going? And you go, oh, she's so smart. She's so funny and she's so strong and so beautiful and so whatever and she whatever, 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 right? You just, there's something that happens to you where like your joy is completed. That's a downstream benefit of worship, but it's not the primary thing. That's a perk. The primary thing is that your eyeballs come off you. Right? Uh, th there's a uh, second downstream benefit of worship, and that is, especially in the corporate context that we're going to talk about today when we gather as a group, where it normalizes devotion to Christ. Right? It normalizes devotion to Christ. If I get together with other believers, with other disciples of Christ, they're imperfect, but they're singing and praising, and they're talking about what God has done in their life, that lets me know I'm not alone, man. I'm not in this battle alone. And that's a downstream benefit of that. There's a guy in the Old Testament. His name was Elijah. He had a big spiritual battle that he was victorious in, but he went and he ended up spending some time alone with God, and he just despairs. He says, man, God, I'm, I'm the last one. I'm the last faithful one. I just want to die. He just totally slips into like this, just this suicidal mode because he's just given up on the world. And God comforts him by saying, you're not the only one. There are actually others who have not bent the knee to false gods and demon gods, right? It's, there are others who are faithful. And when we come together and we worship, there is a benefit to us. 
Now look, I want to talk about worship in a group. You can worship as an individual or you can worship as a group. So I just want to be super clear on that. You, you can listen to worship music at home. You can sing praise at home. You can be out on a walk or a hike or whatever and be worshiping God. But I want to take some time and talk about gathering as a group as a spiritual discipline today. And the reason for that is because people are getting discouraged. People are, uh, are trying to come to church, but you 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 will find that there are a lot of people who need Jesus at church, right? So people show up and they're like, man, I'm going to go to church and all those people are going to act right. And that's not the case. And so people are like, this is just not worth it. And they're like, man, I I'm not doing it. So I want to look at the Bible. I want to look at what it says about this idea of worshiping God and it not being about me. Right? The primary benefit is that I take my eyes off myself and constantly trying to exalt myself. And it's the, just the exhausting work of trying to have people think rightly about me and praise me and understand me. Like I just, It's just like worship just breaks that. And it sets you free from constantly just trying to, to make sure you've got it together and you look good and people are treating you right and acting right and thinking right and all that. Like it just, it stops it. And so when you come together in the congregation and gather and praise God together. Look at look at what the Bible says it does. The book of Psalms is uh, in the middle of your Old Testament. So if you got an old uh, paper Bible, just crack it open. You'll probably hit, if you go to the middle, you'll probably hit Psalms, okay? So the book of Psalm 40 is written by a guy named David. He was uh, described in the New Testament as a guy, as a man after God's own heart. And he wrote a lot of hymns, a lot of songs about worship and praise and grieving and, and so on. So look at Psalm 40. In Psalm 40, verses 9 through 11, he says, I have told the glad news of deliverance in the great congregation. It says, we gather, we're going to gather, and I'm going to speak of the glad news or good news or great news of God's deliverance, his salvation. Behold, I'm not restrained my lips. This is interesting, right? Because we as Christians have kind of gotten into this, this performance mindset where I go to church to watch people up on stage uh, or wherever, however your church is set up, perform. David said, I don't restrain my lips. I don't just stand there with my arms crossed, right? Now, you don't want to sing hypocritically. We're going to talk about that in a second. Like, you don't just want to sing, just go through the motions because that's, that's no good. That's no bueno. We're going to talk about that, okay? David says, I have not restrained my lips, as you know, O Lord. Right? He's talking to God. God, you know what I've done. I'm not hidden your deliverance within my heart. The whole idea of my faith being between me and God is not biblical. Right? Christianity is a corporate thing. Christianity is a family thing. It's a you're part of a body, you're part of a building, you're part like there's lots of illustrations. The idea of, man, that's between him and God. No, that's not biblical. Man, that's between me and God. That's not biblical. I have not hidden your deliverance within my heart. Like, I'm going public with this thing. I have spoken of your faithfulness and your salvation. I have not concealed your steadfast love and your faithfulness from the great congregation. Right? The gathering of God's people. It's like, let me tell you what God has done in my heart. Life. As for you, O oh Lord, you will not restrain your mercy from me. God, you're not going to hold back blessings because you know I'm going to tell others about who you are. God is very concerned with you understanding him correctly. A lot of people paint God, a lot, a lot of really just, we'll give them the benefit of the doubt. A lot of self deceived people, a lot of well meaning but very confused people point to God and say, God's trying to take something from me. And God's like, no, I'm trying to give you abundant life. I'm not coming to steal, kill, and destroy. So he wants us who have received mercy and grace and love and, and justice and truth from God, the good things from God, right? Once we have received these things from him, we want to take those things public so that others will understand. He says, your steadfast love, this is David talking to God again, God, your steadfast love and your faithfulness will ever preserve me. It's a group thing. It's a public thing. Check it out. It, even if you go back a few verses in this passage, you will see David talking about others coming to faith in Christ, like giving God praise because he shares what God has done for him. Look at it in verses two through three. He says, that this is David again saying, God drew me up from the pit of destruction. Now he's using a metaphor here. He's not really in a pit. He drew me up from the pit of destruction out of the miry bog and set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. He put a new song in my mouth. 
right? This isn't just vain, lying worship. Like this is something that God did and it caused something to happen in David. And it's this song, this praise that comes out. A song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. You know what? There are people who are far from Christ and they desperately need the hope that Christ brings. And so they need to see what God has done in other people's lives. That's why when you can bring a friend or a neighbor or family member who's just despairing and hurting and broken to church to hear all these people singing about what God has done for them, that can change their lives and their eternity. That's what he's saying, right? Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. And look, we're, we're after that. We want to see people come to faith in Christ. We want to see people see God as he truly, really is. Not the, the silly caricatures and the lies and the deceit that's, that's floated around our culture. We want to see God as he is. We want others to see him as he is and respond in a trusting, loving relationship. That results in worship, which is what we are talking about. Now, I mentioned the thing about hypocrisy. I want to focus on this line right here. He put a new song in my mouth. Okay, uh, just like sitting there and constra- or restraining your lips, concealing God's goodness in your heart and not telling the congregation, right, doing this in worship, just like that's no good, neither is going through the motions and singing things that you don't mean. So it's really interesting. David said, listen, things happened in my life. God did things in my life that caused genuine, real, true praise to come out of me. We don't want to worship hypocritically. We don't want to be liars saying things to God in front of others that we don't mean. So the way that you fix that is that you preach to yourself before you praise the Lord, right? You preach to yourself before you praise the Lord. So this comes back to that Bible thing that we've talked about. It comes back to the meditation thing that we've talked about. A lot of times we sit and we have a tendency to listen to ourselves, right? You've got a DVD that's going in your mind about, you know, can't believe things went that way. Can't believe she said that. Can't believe this. Can't believe that. God's taken this from me. And we listen to ourselves. What I want us to do is take the DVD out. Don't listen to yourself. Preach to yourself. Like take that DVD out, put a new one in. God loves me. Jesus steps out of eternity and puts on humanity or put, adds humanity to his divinity. He lives a perfect life. He died on the cross to save me from, his, from my sins. He's, he rose again on the third day, and in him I will survive the grave. He's a risen and reigning king right here and now. All authority in heaven on earth has been given to him, and he is invading the darkness, and the gates of hell will not stand against his church, and he's invited me in to be a part of that and to give my life to something significant and powerful, right? We're preaching to ourselves, and in that, something happens in our lives that our praise is genuine, because we don't want to be where these guys are. Look, so this is Jesus confronting Pharisees. These are really religious guys. And he's going to say, yeah, you say one thing, but your hearts are far from me. Check it out. Matthew 15, 8 and 9. It says, this people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their heart, sorry, is far from me. In vain do they worship me. So we're talking about worship and we don't want vain worship. The Bible says don't use God's name in vain. Uh, don't use it as if, it's, as if it's something profane or common, right? God's name is holy, and we want to worship him for what he has legitimately done in our lives. Teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Uh, you don't want to sing and praise and do the church thing where you get in the group and you start saying and singing things that you just don't mean. Okay, that's no good because that's, that's vanity. It's false, fake worship, and so we want to avoid this. Let's get back to the Psalms. I want to look at Psalm 22 through 25, because I want you to see what I really want to get is verse 25, where it's going to say, the praise comes from you, God. The praise comes from uh, things you have done for me. But I want you to catch con- uh, context here because it matters. So I want to start in verse 22, and I want you to see congregational praise again. It says, I will tell of your name to my brothers, right? I'm telling others, okay? I'm, I'm talking to other people. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. Look, there's an expectation in the Bible that you worship by yourself. Okay, again, this can be out on a walk. It can be in your living room early in the morning. It can be in the woods. It can be those things, but there's also an expectation that you worship with others. I hear a lot of folks say, man, my church is in the woods. My church is on the ski slope. My church is on the lake, that kind of thing where they're alone. And let me just say something real quick. There's this great peak nearby, Lolo Peak. 
you can go. It's pretty thickly wooded and lots of trees, lots of ponderosa pines, and you put on snowshoes and you go hiking in that. And then these trees, when it's snowing, it's like dead silent. I mean, it's just silent, silent. Just the, I guess the snow is just absorbing all of the sound until it's just quiet. And you can be there by yourself. And it's a, it's a moment, man. It is a spiritual, worshipful moment. It's you and God in the trees, right? And it's that kind of thing. I, I have times when I'm on the ski lift here in Montana, and I'll look back over my shoulder over the ski lift, and I'll just look down at our valley, and I'm like, this is absolutely amazing, God absolute moment of true, genuine, individual worship. So I want to affirm that. But the whole idea of my church is in the woods doesn't jive because church actually means, like that word in its original language, means an assembly. Like we think of it as a building, but that's not it. It's an assembly of people. It's a group of people. And so you see this, man. This is this is a thing. Is like we are supposed to be in a group of people to build one another up, to serve one another, so that others can come and hear the story of God being sung by other people and what God has done in other people's lives. And so that's why the Bible tells us, don't neglect meeting together for encouragement. But there's this, this aspect as well where I'm telling this to other people. You, I'll get to verse 23 here. You who fear the Lord, praise him. And all you offspring of Jacob, glorify him and stand in awe, uh, all you offspring of Israel. Four, four in verse 24, he has not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, and he has not hidden his face from him, but has heard when he cried to him, from you comes my praise in the great congregation. Remember, this is what I was after, right? Not being a hypocrite, but our praise comes from God what God has done, how his spirit is moving in us. This is genuine worship. This is genuine worship. My vows I will perform before those who fear him. So here's the deal. What I am not advocating for, this is a big no-no, do not do this, okay? Do not go and start singing things just in order to go through religious motions, okay? If you are not a worshiper of God, be honest about that. But don't just start doing it because you're going to do it, right? Because you should, because you're being guilt tripped or because the Bible says you should. If you are not a worshiper, if you are not a praiser of God, ask why. Ask God to show you why, right? I'm not trying to guilt trip you here. We want to just diagnose correctly. We want to assess correctly our spiritual condition go, I'm not a worshiper in the realm of my faith and my walk with Christ, but I'm a worshiper in other areas. Man, this whatever hobby, Man, this golf club's amazing. Man, this rifle is incredible. Man, this food is amazing. Did you see the Seahawks? Man, did you? Praise, praise, praise. Constantly, genuine praise in lots of other areas. If there's not genuine praise coming out of your mouth in, the, in your relationship with God, ask why. Is it that I don't see God as he really is? Is it that I don't see my sin as it really is? And how hideous that is. And I don't see God's love and covering my sin and saving me through Christ, right? If that's the deal, you need to spend some time in the Bible and then meditating and then asking God by the power of his Holy Spirit to show you. God, show me who you are. Show me who I am. Show me my sin. Show me my salvation. Show, let me see these things. And you sit in these things until genuine praise comes out of you. And so what I want to do is I just want to go through a few things that you could sit down and meditate on. There's a bunch that you could do. I chose four that I want to go through and just talk about, man, you could praise God for this. And I want to start with a really hard one. I want to start actually where this verse ends with this idea of fearing God, because this is a stumbling block for people. I'm around churches a whole lot and have been for a while, and I've seen a whole lot of Christians try to remove the fear of God. And they'll say things that are true in the Bible, like perfect love casts out all fear. That's true. But you have to keep that thing in the context of the whole Bible. And see, the Bible brings good news about God's fear and wrath. He says it's there, but God has come and, and Christ has solved it. It's not removed. And so we spiritually, in our walk with Christ, we never want to remove fear of God. We never want to move past God's wrath, which is what I want to talk about. God didn't remove it. He solved it in Christ. And so I want to keep that intact. So this one's going to be weird, but again, it's a stumbling block for people. We can praise God for his wrath against all sin. Right? It's a little weird. People zero in heavily right now, especially in our chapter of history, right? Kind of where we are in history. People zero in on the love of God and God is loving. 
God is compassionate and merciful. That's 100% true. But he's also hostile towards evil. And, and think about this. You would not want to worship anyone who is okay with evil. The problem is, is people try to like get away from this because the Bible says that all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. See, we can praise God for his wrath against all sin, but that, that includes ours. But listen, you do this. Like, just think about you for a second, right? Just think conceptually. When you, you see evil in the world, does it make you angry? When you see abuse, when you see deception or corruption, does it make you angry? If you're like most people, yes. What about if you see someone who's hurting and in need, and you see someone else who can do something but is just apathetic, like indifferent, I don't care, who cares about them? Does that make you angry? Does it make you angry? angry, right? They just go and find distractions. Does it make you angry? Listen, God looks at our sin and our evil. He looks at our apathy and our indifference. He looks at our lies and our deception. He hates it. He has to because he's loving. Look, if God, I say this all the time, if God loves you, he hates the things that are destroying you. The Bible calls that sin. If God loves other people, he hates the things that you're doing that destroy them or take advantage of them. And so there is wrath. And so we can praise God for his justice because he's just, right? Justice is a good thing. You don't want an unjust God. You don't want an unjust judge, right? Imagine that uh, you know of a judge in your city or town where somebody's committing crimes and that person goes before that judge and that judge says, hey, no problem. I'm loving and merciful. No big deal you would be appalled because that judge would be unjust. That would not be a fair, just God. And so we can praise God for his justice that manifests itself in wrath towards evil. Now, when I start talking about God's wrath, people tend to think of New Testament God as nice, cuddly, snuggly God. Like Old Testament God, he's pretty grumpy. He's pretty fired up. He's pretty hostile towards people. He's got something to prove, chip on his shoulder. But New Testament God, no big deal. So I found a New Testament verse on wrath. So in Romans 1.18, uh, God, through the Holy Spirit, says this about the wrath of God in the New Testament again. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. Yeah. New Testament. And it's all over the New Testament. Okay, it's all over the Bible. God is the same in the Old Testament as he is in the New Testament. Don't ever, ever, ever let anyone tell you differently. This is God's wrath. God must be just. But, but wait, we can praise him for his justice, but we can also praise him for his love. We can praise God for his love that paid the price. See, God would stop to be God, I guess, if he was unjust, right? If he didn't bring justice if he didn't hate evil, there would be a character deficiency in him. And God can't go against his nature. So he is just. So he is going to keep justice in place. He is going to rage against sin and evil. And that's good. Like we want a God who is going to eradicate evil and who's going to punish that. But that creates a big problem for us. And that is that that puts us in the judgment seat, right? We, we are not judging others, but we are recipients of God's judgment. Right? That puts us on the stand because we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So what does God do? God sends Jesus to pay for our sins. So we've sinned against God. God's going to be just. He hates sin. But that doesn't mean we have to suffer the consequences of that because Jesus offers to take our place. And so we can praise God for Jesus coming. Look at 1 John. John was one of Jesus' disciples. And in 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 10, John is talking about loving others based on how God has loved us, right? One of the things that you always want to do is you want to treat other people the way that God has treated you. And so that's his argument. But watch him go from that to making his argument about the nature of God. Look at this. He said, beloved, this is, those are who beloved of God, church um, is loved by God and, and loved by me, Pastor John. So not me, Pastor Brad, but Pastor John in the book. He said, beloved, let us love one another for love is from God right? Just like our praise is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. It's a big deal. Like the nature of God is love. And some of you need to hear this. I want to pause for just a second. Some of you need to hear this because you are trying to earn God's love based on your performance. Like you're trying to be good enough. 
God doesn't love you based on what you've done. God doesn't love you based on who you are. God loves you based on his character. And this should be a huge weight off, right? God loves you and desires good for you. He won't force himself on you. And so you have to the, you have that decision to make. You have that conversation with God that you have to have. Uh, he won't force himself on you. But the great news is that you don't have to perform to get his love because God loves out of his nature, who he is, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. That's it, right? Because God hates sin and he's going to be just no matter what. And we can worship him for that. He has to, out of his love, he has to pay for that. If he's going to save you and me, he has to pay for that somehow. And so he sends Jesus. So Jesus comes and takes our place, right? So that we might live through him. And then in verse 10, it says, in this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. And that just means, uh, propitiation is a Bible word that just means a payment that satisfies, Okay. It satisfies that wrath. It satisfies God's justice, right? His judgment saying that sin is evil. Someone has to pay for this. And Jesus stands up and says, I will, because I can. So you've got a choice, right? You can pay for your sins or Jesus can pay for your sins. And, and my prayer and pleading with you, the whole reason we're doing this, this thing, right, is God's glory and your good. My prayer is that you'll receive Christ. And so we can praise Jesus for his love. We can also praise God for his wisdom, like, cause that's remarkable, right? I mean, God retains justice and retains his love in the person of Jesus. Look at how this gets paired together in the book of Exodus. Like, so this is the second book of the Old Testament. And there's this, this Old, Old Testament prophet and leader named Moses. And he asked to see God and see God's glory and to, to be in God's presence. And in uh, Exodus 34, verse 6, it says, The Lord passed before him, that's Moses, and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Good so far, right? This is that loving God part, right? So this is the merciful God part. Verse 7, keeping steadfast love for thousands. It's steadfast love because it's out of his character, not their performance. So even though they're unfaithful and they're unloving, God is going to be faithful and he's going to be loving and he's going to continue to try to extend grace and mercy, but he won't force himself on them, right? So he's, he's going through and keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty. Wait a minute. We, 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 just, we just turned a corner, right? He's steadfast love. He's merciful. He's forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. Those are bad things. Right? But we turn this corner, but who by no means, who will, there we go, who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and the fourth generation. That's that justice piece. But I'm not just going to forgive you because I can't because I'm, I'm holy. I'm just like I'm, I'm not a, an unjust judge. I see evil and I'm not just going to look away. Because that would be wrong. That would be disgusting and evil. So I'm going to keep that. So you've got this merciful thing in the first couple verses. And then you've got this, I'm going to be just thing in the next. And it's like, how do you solve that? You solve it through Christ. You solve that through Christ. So this is, this is just the wisdom of God here saying, I'm going to maintain my justice and I'm going to maintain my love. I'm going to maintain wrath and mercy. I'm going to put these things both together and I'm going to offer the option. I'm going to provide Jesus for you as the way. And so we can praise God. We're talking about worship. We can meditate on that and we can go, God, amen. Like, yes, thank you. Praise God for that. Last one, we can praise God for his patience that gives us time. Some of us take some time to come to the Lord, right? Some of us are hard-headed, stubborn, stiff-necked, slow learners. Like you can frame that as ugly, uh, or as, as gently as you want, but the reality is some of us take some time and we run from God for a long time. Right? I think of the, the story of the prodigal son in Luke 15. Right? He's in his father's house and he says, Dad, I want out. And so he runs, the dad lets him run, and then it takes him a while, but he hits rock bottom, and that's when he comes back. And the father comes just, just and loves him and, and patiently just waits and prays and watches, and, and that's what God has done with you. And God has been patient. And the good news is that we can, if you've come to faith in Christ, you're probably and should be concerned about your neighbors and friends and family members. And God is patient with them. Right? God is patient. Uh, we're going to look at something in Second Peter where Peter's going to say, God 
is slow to return because that's game over and he desires that none should perish and all should come to faith. Let's look at it real quick. So Second Peter, the setup here is Peter's going to be dealing with scoffers, right? People mocking Christians and mocking the story of God, mocking the gospel and the kingdom of God. And they're going to say, where's God? Where is he? Nothing's changed. He's never coming back. This is all just lies and he's not going to punish sin. There's no wrath. There's no judgment. There's none of that. And, and look, look at what Peter says. He says in verse 3, scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires. Okay, it's in their heart, right? It's just what they're doing is coming out of the heart. It's the whole point of this series is God change my heart, change my heart, change my heart, and let my behaviors change out of that. So these scoffers are just being themselves. They want to be God themselves. They will say, where is the promise of his coming? Jesus is coming back. When's he going to do that? When's he going to come rescue everything? When's he going to come put things right? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. All right? People just look around going, man, things are like they always have been. And he's going to launch into this idea about uh, this, this story of the flood. He's going to go creation. He's going to go story of flood. Look at verse 5. He says, for they deliberately, over, they deliberately overlook this fact that the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God. Okay, so we've got this thing where creation is put in place and God in creation in Genesis says, it is good, it is good, it is good. Okay, and that comes through water and that by means of these, the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. Okay, so we're doing water again, but now he's talking about the flood. He's talking about evil people just filling up the world and God saying, nope, I'm going to clean it. Here's judgment, right? We do this weird thing in kids' ministries across uh, the world where it's like, hey, let's color a, a picture of Noah's Ark. Like, that's a story of judgment, like total wiping the slate clean except for eight people, right? God's like, no, I, I'm not going to tolerate evil. So he is going to purify again. And so Peter continues in verse 7, and let's make sure... Uh, we get to verse 7, it says, but by the same word, the heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. He's saying judgment is coming again. God hates sin. God hates things that destroy you and destroy others. Hates it and won't tolerate it forever. And so Peter's saying that's real. That's coming. That is who God is. But, in verse 8, do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. Seems like a long time to you, but it's not to God. Watch this. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count, sl uh, slowness, as some count slowness, but is patient. This is what we're going to praise God for, is him being patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. God is patient, and so he's worthy of praise, right? I struggle with patience, man. I've got kids, and it takes them a long time to learn stuff. There's constant just like goofing up and messing up and, and direct disobedience and defiance, and I'm like, ah, oh, what am I going to do with you, right? And so we've just settled in. My wife and I have settled in. Like we are just, we are playing the long game, right? We're, we're just going to be patient. We're going to correct. We're going to discipline. We're going to coach. We're going to challenge. We're going to pray. We're going to teach. We're going to do all these things, but we know that it's going to take some time. God takes some time with us, and we can worship him for that. And God takes time with our loved ones and our neighbors and our friends and our family, right? There is grace and there is mercy, and he gives us space and doesn't force himself upon us. Now, my question for you is this. What are you going to do? If you have never heard or never understood, or maybe you've been ignoring and finding distractions to not think about God's wrath and not think about God's love and not think about his wisdom, and you don't understand that God's being patient, not because he's okay with the way that you're living, but because he wants you to come to faith and he wants you to come to repentance, then my question is this, what are you going to do? Our prayer, our desire is that you would put your faith in Christ that you would come to Jesus, that you would see your sin as it is, see his love and mercy as it is, see the mission that he's calling you to and the value that there is in life and the, and the light that he wants to bring into this world and wants to use you as, and, and, and partner with you as part of that. We, man, our prayer is that you see that and that you join Christ in that. Our prayer is that you turn away from your sin. You turn away from your allegiance to the things that destroy you and others. That you stop putting your hope in these other things and worshiping these other things that are only going to fail you. My prayer is that you would admit that you're a sinner, believe that Jesus was the Son of God who came to take away your sins, and commit to follow him as the risen and reigning king. 
In fact, if you're ready to take that step, I want to walk you through that prayer, admitting, believing, and committing, and there's nothing magical in the words. I just want you to draw a line in the sand where you say enough is enough of worshiping false things. I'm going to give my life to Christ, and I'm going to worship him. So wherever you are, I'm going to ask you to bow your head and close your eyes, and I'm just going to say uh, a, a simple prayer that I would encourage you to say uh, after I finish speaking, right? So I'll, I'll say one thing, then you say it, then I'll say it, then you say it, and we're just going to walk through. Again, nothing magical. Let's pray. God, I admit I am a sinner, but I believe Jesus is the Son of God who paid for my sins. And I commit to follow him as the risen and reigning king. Heavenly Father, we love you and we thank you for your word. We thank you for your patience. We thank you that you, do, you are not a, a God who tolerates evil, but we thank you that you provided payment for us in Christ. We thank you that you have loved us. And so, God, we give you all the praise and we give you all the glory. And, God, we do genuinely worship you out of what you have done for us. So, God, we pray that you are honored in this and glorified by that. We pray that others would see our adoration and our genuine worship of you and that they, too, would come to fear your wrath but trust your provision and your love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, it's been an honor to worship here with you and to talk about how to be changed by God. If you're watching on our webpage, there's a couple ways that you can interact with us. One, if there's something going on with your life, we would like to pray with you. And so there's a link for you to click uh, to submit a prayer request. And we commit to pray with you on that. So you can find that on the webpage. You can also find a communication card. If you prayed to receive Christ or you've got questions about who we are as a church or where we're going or how we're going to come out of COVID-19 or whatever, you can communicate with us through that communication card. There's also a place that you can give to support if you want to support what we are doing and the mission that we are on to bring light into a dark and desperate world. We're chasing hard after this world that Jesus came to save. If you want to support us, we'd appreciate that. We promise to be faithful in how we use it. If you're not online, you can also direct message us on social media or private message us on social media or email us at info at wamazulachurch.com and we will be quick to respond and quick to uh, help out in any way we possibly can. Please know we love you, we are praying for you, and we are fighting for you and not against you. We love you. God bless.